Hello, welcome everyone who is joining us and uh, welcome and thanks for everyone for joining in our panel today at Horace's Global Meet of 2022. Uh, my name is Amandeep and I am based in Denmark. I've been to technology space with large telecom providers, e-commerce ventures and recently into banking and fintech. As our topic uh, of this panel says, the cost of lost data. And before that, like uh, I'll just remind that as the saying goes, data is a new oil. In this fast-paced world, that we uh, where dependence on data is increasing, and it has increased a lot during pandemic times, there's also a consideration towards what if the data gets lost, or it is not available when it's needed, or it is stolen. Uh, as different studies reveal, uh, an, an average American business has incurs a cost of lost data for about 7,900 US, US dollars per hour of downtime, per hour of unplanned downtime. And 40% of that can be attributed to hardware. The rest, yes, we'll discuss that. An average cost of breach otherwise in US in 2020 figures also goes around 8.6 million US dollars. While global average was much lower, around 3.86, but still it's in few million US dollars for each breach. And <clears throat> we have set of extremely qualified two panelists uh, who are with me who will drive this conversation. We have Murray uh, from UK and we have Luis from Spain representing the best of their fields and, and the subject matter experts. And in this discovery of topic around costs of lost data, we'll touch upon also the topics related to what is data governance, what is the ideal data strategy, uh, where the data needs to be guarded, and what are the costs and impacts of this lost data. So without taking any further time, I would in like to invite uh, the panelists here, maybe the first panelist, Murray, to introduce yourself and uh, continue this conversation. Over to you, Murray. Sure, thank, thanks, Amandeep. And I, I see you, you mentioned the price of, of an hour of downtime costing about $7,900. Um, I've been working in a previous life at a different company. We worked at a cyber, uh, not a cyber, a, a payments gateway. Uh, and that payments gateway, that was down, it, it literally cost hundreds of thousands per, per hour. So it can, can be quite extreme. Um, I'm, uh, I'm CTO of ProArc. Um, we're a systems integrator. We provide IT services across uh, five different pillars to organizations. Uh, and those different pillars uh, include uh, cybersecurity, uh, software development, data and AI, cloud infrastructure, and they've got a, a quality assurance business as well. So um, we're quite in, in, in an interesting place because we've got such a broad uh, remit over the different uh, technology areas. Uh, we end up dealing with with data from both ends of the spectrum, uh, both from a security perspective, where we're trying to you know, keep it safe and make sure that you know it doesn't leak and uh, and it's well managed. But at the same time, uh, we deal with in our data and AI practice. Uh, a lot of the focus there is around business users trying to get access to data, um, and we we do a lot of juggling and balancing to help organisations navigate uh, their risk position so that they can determine. Uh, how much data they want to share with who, when, um, and, and what their appetite is is for doing that. Um, and that kind of competing dilemma um, kind of ends up pivoting on sort of three key areas uh, that we look at in terms of managing it. Um, uh, the first of those is kind of technology and tools to avoid data loss. Uh, so when it comes to uh, traditional cybersecurity, <clears throat> six billion or uh, trillion or whatever it was last year, a huge amount um, outgoing in terms of cyber loss. Uh, and the cost of cyber loss um, still far exceeds the budgets in play for cyber security. Um, so it's, it's still a, a very profitable business for cyber crimi criminals. Um, and, and those technologies um, all add sort of different stage gates uh, into your organizations to try and stop the, the different types of, of breaches you, you typically occur. Um, and those may be uh, coming from inside of your organization through disgruntled employees uh, or from external malicious actors. Um, and there's also a, you know, not all breaches are malicious. Uh, some of them are accidental. Uh, so not, not only do you have to worry about people inside and outside of your organization, but there's also uh, both uh, you know, intent, malicious and, and accidental loss. Um, there's there's a, a great set of tools um, 
most modern cloud providers, uh, particularly productivity workspace providers, offer, offer information rights management, um, which allows you to control who you share your data with and who can read your documents, um, and also uh, provide auditing and logging, so you can actually go and uh, look through that uh, <clears throat> look through that data um, and see who has actually touched what, what piece of data. And that's typically around documents, uh, primarily spreadsheets. Um, I think. Uh, in 2021, I think 64% of financial service companies had more than a thousand sensitive documents available to everyone in the organization. Um, and a lot of that is people um, either not working with the right security controls um, or using traditional file shares uh, and exposing data to each other. So uh, you need a robust set of technologies for dealing with, with both uh, managing documentation, uh, modern cloud, uh, integrated uh, you know browser integrated platforms are really good at that you can actually share a document and through that browser have that control over the document um, or embed some sort of headers into the document that prevents uh, people from sharing it um, unnecessarily or incorrectly um, there's also tools that you can put onto your email accounts that look for large amounts of data egress uh, through your through your email server um, whether that's accidental attached by mistake um, and also, you know, starting to get towards AI, uh, we start to find tools that can match up between uh, what's being sent out of an organization and if it's the right thing appropriate for the right audience. Um, uh, the kind of simplest version of that is just telling the difference between internal and external audiences and making sure that, um, you know, people people are really busy. Busy is kind of the new normal these days. Um, and being busy, um, they're always quick to kind of distribute data mm-hmm. and need to make sure it's going to the right people. Um, so there's a lot of technology you can put in place, um, and, and that kind of kind of closes the the front door and the back door to to, to some extent. You, you can't always uh, you know monitor each and every interaction. There's new technologies and uh, new releases, and, and and the technology world is moving so fast. It's very hard to stop people sharing data. So not only do you need to just uh, you know, look up the front door and, and the back door. Um, but so is policy really important. Um, so creating your standards, making sure that people are aware of them, security training, and both in your culture, hiring and screening of people you bring into the organization um, is, is very important. Um, the kind of second, the second area that, that I think is really important to this conversation is starting to be able to uh, calculate uh, and quantify risk. So um, I think the historical conversation with the, with the board, the CISO would go to the board and he'd say, I need X budget for cybersecurity. And the board would say, you know, how is that spend going to translate in, into a level of protection? Um, and the CISO would just say, well, because we need the budget. Um, and, and that's starting to become an area of focus. There's a lot of tools emerging at the moment around something called uh, quantitative risk management. Um, and these are all different methods and approaches for being able to structure um, your cyber risk, evaluating the risk based on a number of key factors uh, that I can maybe go into a bit later. Uh, but looking at the risk from the different factors and the cost and the impact of those risks, once you understand those risks, you can then start to build a financial model on what it may look like to lose that data uh, from a you know, reputational perspective or litigation and legal perspective, uh, sum all of those up and then uh, be able to present some risk metrics to the board. So you, you typically be able to build a model around around understanding uh, that risk position, quantified with some numbers, uh, and then be able to you know, contrast that against A, your PNL to see what the impact would be, uh, and, and B, your cyber security spend. Um, and the idea is to get to a position where you can manage and understand your position on your cyber risk, and, and calculate a return on security investment. So for every dollar we spend on security, uh, based on our risk profile and the way we understand our business, we think we're actually going to save X amount if it's a potential uh, you know, breach or ransomware event. Um, and then as history builds, so you can start to bring in some AI to come in and analyze your historical position, look at your threat systems and start to calculate some of that, that risk for you. Um, not only is this important uh, to a, a board so they know what they're getting for the security spend, it's also becoming uh, more and more popular for uh, cyber insurance companies to take an interest in, in an organization's attention to, to detail um, and assess their risks. So these frameworks are starting to be used by cyber insurance companies 
Um, and that will help you, you know, if you've got a, a good risk policy, a, a good strategy, um, the right tools and techniques in place, and you're able to calculate and quantify your risk, uh, then you're able to uh, you know, negotiate with your cybersecurity uh, organization uh, who provides in your insurance and, and, and get a premium um, so that you can be adequately protected in the case of a loss. Um, and the third one I wanted to touch on is that not only um, is it important to look up to the tools and make sure the front door and back door are protected from data egress, uh, having the right quantified methodologies, uh, but also putting the right data governance in place. Um, and that's, you know, there's many different data governance framework, but they're all centralized around your architecture, or operations, and your data quality, mastering, integration, interoperability, and warehousing. And not only it's important to understand where that's happening in the organization and how it's happening in the organization, it's important to understand the various endpoints that you're exposing. Um, in the modern cloud-connected world, it's very easy to set up and, and share data uh, with, with external organizations, and you need to put the right levels of security in play um, you know, as a gateway. Um, I think you know, the data governance, I think you can read about this. There's tons of topics about it. Um, but understanding how your identity flows through your organization uh, is one of the critical aspects for us. Uh, knowing who accessed what and when, um, and implementing integrated tools that fit in with your identity, whether that's a Microsoft Azure account or a Google account, mm -hmm. making sure that you can tie data to people as frequently as possible. Um, and, and then sort of that's kind of the proactive side and then reactively always being able to audit and understand who's been where um, for non-repudiation. Mm -hmm. um, Ideally, you want to do as much proactively as possible uh, and, and reduce the amount of reactive uh, security you need to do. Um, but those are just uh, the kind of three key areas that I think are, are very important. Obviously, they don't all stand alone. They need to be um, aggregated together uh, and, and brought into a cohesive data strategy uh, that you can outline for your, for your organization. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. Like a uh, few interesting things which I get from is like the cost computation. If you can actually do a cost computation, which can be actually used to decide the budget for cybersecurity. And uh, sometimes in the organization, we don't have skills to kind of compute that cost so that the budget for cybersecurity also can be decided. And maybe sometimes you need consultants for that. <laughs> and uh, yes. so we do a lot of, we help, we help our companies do that. Yeah. And uh, second was also like, uh, I mean, like we're coming back. This is like uh, data governance and data stewards and kind of like data steward is a new role, which kind of I am creating with the organization, which I am consulting. Uh, so basically controlling around that. Uh, but yeah, a lovely hearing. We'll come back to that. And uh, I would now actually ask Luis to actually uh, take this conversation further with uh, more on the impacts and the mitigations and how you have seen the industry evolve, ev everything from your side. Over to you. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, to have the opportunity of uh, sharing our thoughts about uh, the cost of, uh, uh, of data loss. And um, I think that the, I'm the CEO of SIA, and SIA is uh, one of the largest cybersecurity players uh, coming out of Spain. We are 1,500 people. We are part of uh, Indra Minsight, that is the largest Spanish technology group. We, we operate in 14 countries, providing services to our customers. We are one of those consultants and su supporting our customers in this process, as we said. So happy to have a further discussion if that, if that is needed. But I think that uh, for me, what is very interesting, I'm going to, to, ex to talk more from the experience we had in the last years and in the recent months uh, about what is happening to our customers and to the industry without uh, revealing uh, names, but what we have learned. And it's very interesting because uh, last year in this uh, first quarter, we have worked Directly, we have been involved in over 30 major data incidents, including uh, within data, the Ramson work that I'm going to explain about. And what is fascinating, and uh, not sure if it is also concerning, is that um, everybody knew what had to be done, but they haven't. They haven't done it. Right, so they have pretty much the list of tools, as uh, more said. They have the list of uh, policies, the list of actions, but they haven't implemented that. 
so they have faced the results of a lack of focus on ensuring that uh, you actually do what you say you are going to do. And this is for me probably the major outcome you can take from this uh, uh, conversation. And is that I'm sure you're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, I'm sure I know it. Please just check that you have those controls, understanding that we're going to refer to in the next minutes uh, within your actual plans and with your way of working as an organization, regardless of the size uh, you have. So one of the very interesting things is uh, why we say that data now is, is concerning for everybody. Well, you mentioned that the data is the new oil, as uh, it is said. But more importantly, I think that it is because we are moving into a more digital world. And in the digital world, the actual value of data is how it flows, where it resides, how it supports processes of business, of people's lives. And it means that uh, suddenly understanding what is the role of data as the main critical asset of companies that are moving into the digital world is probably one thing that is very, very important. And to me, this is, as uh, Mario said, this is a board discussion. So what is the data that is really making us a different company, a different organization serving to citizens? So my first recommendation today is make sure that you reflect internally as a team, as a board, as a set of executives, uh, what is the value of data for you? The second thing is that there are four, what we call forces that are making data more relevant to companies in a cybersecurity environment. The first one is regulation. I'm sure that we are all understanding very well the impact of regulation and how this is affecting to our companies and organizations because data is becoming something that we have the responsibility to protect. We have the need to set up the framework in which that data can operate. And we have the uh, liability in front of our consumers or our employees to protect that data. The second force that we see why this is becoming more relevant is IT transformation. We used to have our data extremely well kept, maybe in one server, even underneath yeah. our table at, uh, at our office. Suddenly, data is everywhere. Is in that place that we call the cloud, that is not clear yeah. where it is. But data, our data, the data of our customers is somewhere there. So it means that we have to set up new tools, new procedures to understand where that data resides, how that data flows from one place to the other, and how we ensure that we either own, protect, or we delete, just delete that data when it is needed. The third interesting force on top of regulation and IT transformation is what we call connected infrastructure. And is that traditionally data was more related to people. Now it is extending to devices, to machines, to sensors. So we have now the accountability in front of our society as heads of uh, businesses to understand that some of the data is not just linked to people is also linked to uh, devices, machines that are really operating in our environment. And the fourth one is that we are more digital. And the more digital we are as individuals, the more digital are the way we operate. Our digital identity becomes something that we have to protect. And, and this is new. We didn't use to say, no, I am Luis. And to prove that I am Lewis when I connect to a place is not just that I enter my user and password, it's also that I'm able to support that my digital identity has been registered somewhere and that is validated somewhere else. So I think that those four forces is what is bringing more value. And this is why we are having our discussion today. What is interesting is that when you look to how to respond to these four forces, to these drivers, there are a number of strategies that need to be put in place. And in our experience at SIA, is that when you discuss with customers, uh, there is a little bit of a, a mess around the plans and activities. So we have identified that the five steps 
into really executing a proper plan is first providing the awareness to everybody of the relevance of data. As we said, data is a digital asset. So if you really want to ensure that data is well understood as that asset of your organization, you need to train people, you need to make them aware from the board down to the, uh, the new granted uh, employee that you have for a few weeks, because they have to understand that. And probably to show that, you need to name a proper DPO, data protecting officer, who is able really to make a difference for uh, your organization. So the first thing is make sure that you have a very clear awareness plan. The second one is identify that data. Make sure that you drive properly the process internally to know where that data is generated, what is the origin of that data, and how that data goes into the organization. And as when you look to water pipes, where that data could be leaked. Because if you understand that, then you are able to do the third thing, which is protecting and putting the right envelopes, tools, and so on in that process. Because sometimes we've, we found that organizations, they don't realize that some of that data goes to an external supplier and that the data comes back. That is a perfect moment for having leakage. And that is an amazing opportunity for people who would like to extract or exfiltrate that data to take over. The fourth thing is uh, ensuring that you have the tools to detect that things have happened to your data. Sometimes we don't realize that uh, some people are taking out data, intellectual property, information of our company that is key. So there are tools to do that. There are ways of protecting how much, what is the size of an email that someone is going to send with a lovely file of the names and addresses of all your customers. Uh, it's possible to use some tools to, to some extent put the walls around your data assets. And a lot of companies, organizations, they think that this is going to generate some kind of difficulties on the daily operations. But personally, I do recommend that you really do that properly. And the fifth one, so once you have the awareness, you have identified what is your data, how to control it, uh, you ensure that you have the ways of protecting the data and you are able to detect and to respond to that data leakage is to be able to recover. You would be amazed the number of organizations when we are looking to ransomware, they have not checked properly where and how they keep their backups. And this is terrible in the sense that when they work as a team, uh, they look back and say, okay, so no, no, don't worry, we do have backups. But they have backups in the same system that has been encrypted, so they cannot access to those backups. And, and someone says, oh, I don't have any physical copy anymore because we are now very digital. We have cloud services and so on. Well, please make sure that someone in your organization is keeping a physical copy of your active directory so that you can really recover in case you have a, a, a ransomware. So I think that that is a set of perspective of where we see the evolution and that uh, on the data. Uh, risk and losses. In terms of the impact that we have seen, well, I think we, we have told about that. Um, we have a lot of figures as well, but I'm going to focus on what are the actual risk. So the first risk, if you are a board member or if you are uh, just an executive in an organization and you have a board, is that the board could go to jail, which is well, probably is a bit dramatic but it can happen. Or the minimum, they could be fired, as it happened in a number of organizations. The chairman, the CEO, they have to leave the company because they lose, they lost the data of their customers, of their consumers. Critical data, financial data, health data, that is more than just custodians of uh, uh, pure numbers, right? So I think that that is the first very important impact. The economic impact, is much more surprising uh, in many of our customers because they just have made a calculation, I would say, in a rough base of what would be, oh, what is the cost of getting a new customer? 
And if I lose that data, maybe I lose the customer. In reality, your actual cost is that you cannot run your business. But the level of disruption, if your data is lost or encrypted, uh, is huge. And we have been with customers who has been out of business during five days. So it means that during five days, you couldn't access your clinics, you couldn't access to the right health insurance. And that is a very, very critical problem. The final uh, thing on this space is the brand reputation, which is absolutely terrible for organizations. Uh, there has been a number of public incidents where public agencies in countries, they've lost their data of their citizens. They couldn't pay uh, em employee subsidies. They have to stop for weeks the service to citizens and the damage in reputation is huge. If you are an enterprise, clearly this could affect your ongoing business quite dramatically. And I want to finish with something that uh, to some extent Mori mentioned, and is that one critical action for all of us is ensuring that we have our employees as our first line of protection of our data, which means that we have to make people aware that they handle something that is very fragile and is a high risk, not just for them, but for the whole business or operations they run. So if they know that they are the defenders of that critical mm -hmm. asset of the organizations, I'm sure they are going to behave in a very different way. And then you can push the multi-factor authentication and many other uh, things. Uh, th thanks, Lou. Yes, that was a kind of a very uh, broad and very kind of intense also uh, perspective on uh, what's the impact and uh, the possible mitigations and uh, the things that you suggested, or like employee talking with the first level of defense on the data side. Uh, one very interesting thing which you also touched was like data pipes, like uh, we also discussed in kind of different architectural discussions. Like, yeah, we see that like this is the plumbing that <laughs> this is how the data flows and like the pipes the same so where leaks are where the ingress or ingress points are and what what could go wrong where where the security uh, is could get compromised when those messages data data is exchanged mm. So we have some, uh, and also like something around uh, which you mentioned, like tools to find out what has happened to your data, um, which I personally see and Murray can also kind of agree, I believe is like, uh, we are also moving from like tooling around, like not just logging, but observability, uh, lo logging every kind of X coming, I think it's required as part of some, some things required by, as per GDPR as well. Uh, that it's a digitally auditable uh, product, like which data was accessed for uh, for which request for which purpose. Like, and also, also the data dictionary is also kind of keeping the intent why we need to keep this data and what's the kind of a consequence if we lose that piece of data. So intent column, when we add into data dictionary also kind of uh, makes the employees, I believe, aware like, hey, why this data is important for us. Uh, backups and all, yeah, I think uh, we are, we know the state of industry overall, like uh, we are, we are nowhere kind of a very standard. So I do have some kind of a questions which were kind of a pre-collected. So let me just ask you a couple of questions on this is like, one is I think coming, maybe Murray, you can, you could start with because uh, uh, that is one thing around like, can the cloud providers be held liable for data loss? Like it's a, I know it's a very generic and very broad question, but from your perspective, where do you see an organization who is using a cloud provider uh, can pass the blame? Or... Yeah, I think I think I think there's a there's a, the, 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 there's a harsh reality, and there's also a, a, probably a legal perspective. So when you engage with a cloud provider, um, what you need to think about is the size of their legal teams <laughs> and and what sort of inroads you can make. Um, so. I think it's very difficult to to litigate. And maybe if there was some sort of failing, uh, sort of widespread broad broad failing in in a service um, that leaked information across multiple uh, customers, uh, that then you potentially got got a case you could follow through on. Um, but in in general, the terms and conditions of the cloud providers are are very clear in terms of their responsibility. Um, they are generally. Um, providing a service, a capability, and then what you do with that service 
is up to you. Um, you know, so uh, I can I can go to any any of the major cloud provider, any cloud provider. I can go and build a website that's publicly available, and I can go and put my customer list on it, and anyone can browse it. Um, so the cloud provider indemnifies them from all of that type of responsibility. If there's something fundamentally insecure in the way that a protocol or something is implemented, um, then you've, you've potentially uh, got a case. So if you've got implemented your uh, Google or Microsoft identity protection, you've uh, locked everything down, you've followed best practice, and still somehow there's a breach, um, then it needs to become a, a case of whether it's, it's, it's negligence in terms of has the cloud provider built their service incorrectly, um, is there an actual flaw in what they've built, um, or is it uh, um, you know, just an evolution of, uh, uh, you know, it was secure last month, there's been a zero-day exploit, and, and now someone's found a new route. And, um, so I think it would be very difficult to, uh, to, to hold a cloud provider accountable. Um, yeah. I if, I, guess. if I may... If I may, indeed, just to complement what Mori has just said, is um, I think that there are two things here that are very relevant for the topic we discussed. The first one, you cannot delegate data ownership to a cloud provider, right? So you are the owner of that data. It doesn't matter if it is underneath your desktop or if it is somewhere in the cloud. And that sometimes we think that, oh, because I'm using a third party, uh, I don't need to put in place the right procedures, tools, and so on. So that is the first thing. So ensure that you don't delegate that. Uh, that is very relevant. The second thing is uh, the complexity of, uh, especially on hybrid cloud environments, under our experience is that the tools and technologies are available. People, in some cases, are not using them properly. So my recommendation, a little bit selfish, I have to tell you, is use an expert, right? Talk to companies like ours who have been doing this for a number of years and with a lot of customers and ask for help to make sure that when you put your data and your services, you understand how you are going to upload the data, download the data, protect the data, uh, yes, hide the data, ensure that you have the right access methods to that data. It, we still see probably over 60% uh, of the customers we deal with that they don't have a what is called a privileged access management solution. So that they give users and passwords to database administrators or to systems administration lacking a good control of that. From an audit perspective, but more importantly for a the risking what they do with that user and password. So I think that there are a number of things that could be done. And my recommendation is uh, work with someone that can help you to do that implementation. Sorry that I jumped in. No, no, absolutely. That, that was very actually important. Um, my, I, I'm jumping to the next question actually in the span of time is uh, actually it's coming to Luis, you that regarding ransomware, uh, should there be kind of a central or global policy or otherwise kind of how do we tackle with that menace, which is kind of continuously rising? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that from a policy perspective, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is that regulation is changing and it's not the same in terms of uh, the different markets in which you operate. So it means that you need, uh, again, having a good understanding. There are a lot of discussions about data sovereignty these days. Uh, and some uh, states and countries are saying, no, I want to ensure that the data of my citizens is just in my physical territory and is no longer available elsewhere. Well, this is totally in opposition to the... Uh, let's say, functionality of a digital world, right? So the digital world is global in itself. So it means that if you really want to drive um, the support of legal uh, as GDPR in Europe, uh, you remember what happened with the Europe and the US with a number of discussions of uh, uh, the shield uh, environment and, and how 
to some extent be able to change regulation or to protect data of uh, citizens. It happens the same thing even within the European Union and some countries, of course, in many other markets. So I think that uh, you can try to set up your own internal policies on a global basis, but in terms of being the custodian of data of customers, consumers, it's very important that you understand the regulation in the markets in which you operate. You are mute, I think, and the... <laughs> my, my apologies. So, yes, I have a connected question which is coming actually to both of you. Is like, uh, have privacy-oriented regulations like the GDPR and, as you said, like your internal global policy, which is, I will say that it's still internal, right? Uh, so, does these kind of regulations and uh, policies make the life of data governance live data governance and protection more difficult or relatively standardized and easy? Yeah, I'm happy to start and, and you can jump in as well. I think I think the GDPR is designed to be fair on everyone. Um, it's fair to the consumers. It's fair to you, me, Luis, and the rest of the world, um, how their data is treated. Um, so I think, uh, I think GDPR, uh, even though it adds a little bit of overhead, um, it, it's definitely... <coughs> move uh, the needle in the right direction in terms of paying more attention to, to personal data. Um, myself, probably as much as the next person, uh, doesn't really want uh, to be on everyone's spam list. I don't want the whole world to know my personal details, where I live, etc. Yeah. So it's absolutely critical uh, protect, to protect that information, particularly that smaller subset of, of PII. Uh, and whilst it's caused a little bit of a headache for organizations to, to get control of and get a grip on, um, I think it's... Um, uh, I think it's very welcome. Um, and I think GDPR has been quite interesting uh, in the last year or so. I know Amazon got fined around 750 million. WhatsApp yes. sharing data with Facebook, um, they had to pay around 200 million. Um, and I know, you know, it, just looking at, at, at the list of GDPR cases coming through, uh, every month there's, sort of, you know, there's maybe a couple of hundred cases uh, and, and fines issued uh, all the way down from sort of a thousand a thousand euros or thousand dollars up to, to to multiple millions. So um, the GDPR is is helping to manage and enforce a bit of security and privacy around data, um, which which can only be a good thing. Sure, there's an impact on technology. You need to take uh, more appropriate care um, in your IT systems. Um, but through your data governance processes, through master data management, through understanding what data is stored in which systems, um, you, you can get a grip on that um, relatively easy. I think large enterprises really struggle. Um, I know I was dealing with a bank a few years ago. Um, and they were talking about becoming GDPR compliant when the regulation was coming in order. Uh, and then they had systems that identified that had some sort of personal data in it. Um, so it's... Um, and it, it can be a bit of a headache, but I think GDPR and GDPR compliance is a, is a really good good thing to have. Yep. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's funny um, in the sense that uh, you could imagine that we are, in CIA, we are a very techie company, right? Because we are in cybersecurity, we work in that space. We have 20 lawyers in our team. Uh, because customers are asking precisely what Mori was just saying. It, you know, help me in this environment. And I would separate uh, two things. One is uh, privacy, and the other one is data protection. Because I think that um, uh, data protection is something that companies, organizations can drive, whilst privacy is something that users and consumers should drive, right? And, and I think that there is a joint responsibility in that, uh, let's say, match of those two things. Because privacy is something that we have to manage also as individuals. And sometimes to get, we ask them to say, yes, I accept all cookies in this website without even reading what the data is going to be used for. Right. So privacy is a more consumer responsibility. And this is why we can see penalties as the one that more described, because people are not helping people to manage their own privacy data. And the other part, which is uh, the data protection, is also very relevant because it's something that companies should run. One thing that is, uh, and I'm not sure if uh, this is going to sound politically correct, 
but uh, we tend to share data uh, of incidents uh, when you are a bad guy, right? So bad guys, they all share uh, data and they share the tools and the vulnerabilities of systems and so on. And we, the good guys, let's say, we don't share these kind of incidents and data breaches. In some cases, because if we share them, we have the GDPR authorities come in to put a penalty on you. And they should be the opposite. It should be a reward if you have had a data breach and you share it and you show others what could happen to them, that instead of having a penalty, right, because you have shared that, then you get an incentive to, of course, protecting that going forward, but at the same time, not getting a penalty directly in that very moment, which is something that is interesting. So that fine balance between, oh, you should have protected that data and because you share that this data has had a, a breach, now you are having a penalty is something that probably we have to refine. Yes, thanks. That That's actually a, a very interesting way to look at it. And I have probably my last question but coming to both of you is around, because as we also mentioned, that digital transformation and increased digitalization. And uh, if we see the 2020 kind of numbers on the 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 data loss incident, 40% were attributed to hardware, 30% human, and the rest was malware, ransomware, thefts. So from, from a strategy point of view, from like digital transformation strategy, and also including the budgets, budgets planning for cybersecurity, where do you see the allocations could go? Uh, what what could be the like the top uh, areas to consider? Any Any, any last thoughts on this question before we finish? Well, happy to start. I, I think that uh, concerning data, uh, in terms of uh, order, uh, the first one is ensuring that you have data well identified and the uh, right backups for that data as the core base and their tools to avoid data protection laws and, and so on. So I think this would be my first uh, way to spend the money. Uh, the second one would be how people are accessing the data and what I said in terms of having this privileged account management, the administrators, the software people that are accessing to some data is something that you have to handle. Again, there are tools there. The third layer would be this uh, internal uses with identity access management tools and, and processes. That is something that is critical. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one that is more an ongoing tool is this kind of awareness and uh, employee awareness kind of programs that for me are very critical as well and you can do that with uh, a degree of uh, gaming around that or whatever the method but just making sure that uh, they, everybody understands that right yeah. thanks uh, more you have the last minute here yes to okay. conclude yeah i think i think just just to add to what, what Lewis was saying um, I think there's some great frameworks out there that you can take a look at. Uh, for example, the CIS 20, 20 critical controls, which are kind of the top 20 things that you need to look at. Um, if you're an organization, if you're uh, into software development uh, and building applications for people to use or people are building applications for your organization, uh, there's an OWASP top 10, um, which is a, a top 10 yeah. um, sort of ranked list that gets updates yeah. from time to time of, of major vulnerabilities. Um, and if you start with those and, and sort of expand from there, um, that's a, that'd be a good strategy to, to getting you know, kind of your, your foot on the first rung of, of good security. Yes, many thanks. Many thanks, both of you, actually, for this panel and this uh, insightful discussions. Uh, I know that the field itself is emerging and challenges emerge every day, like 2019 numbers, 2020 numbers, 2021, 2022. They are so drastically different on, on data loss. Like what strategies, what protections could effectively be placed? Like uh, 200 incidents on GDPR and multi multi multiple inc incidents on uh, violations uh, around uh, data loss and no standard uh, kind of policy uh, worldwide on ransomware. So we are in for a little bit of turbulent times, but I think uh, investing in good tools and good technology is going to help and uh, focus by an organization. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for joining, and I will stop this recording now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.